as a percentage anymore. of cars that are in the UK though, right now, Archer, is it's probably, <laughs> that's probably 150 percent. Yeah, exactly. Every so you say you've got a McLaren, and within the next 10 seconds, somebody will undoubtedly say, "I bet that's not very reliable." Yes, McLarens do have a reputation for not being reliable, but is it justified? I'm here today at Thorny Motorsport in Brackley, and we're going to try and find out the answer to that question. I've owned a 570S and my ownership experience was very positive, indeed, as are the ownership experiences of a lot of other guys and girls on the McLaren Owners Club. We're going to be speaking to John Thorne, who's seen a lot of McLarens in his time, and try and get an understanding as to just why this seems to be the case. Is it accurate? A good representation of McLarens have arrived today. Storm Grey appears to be the colour of the moment. There's three here today. That was indeed the colour of the car I owned. One just leaving over there. Very nice indeed. And yeah, we're just going to have a look around, have a chat and see what's going on. So let's crack on. The visual check is to run your finger down it and if it feels reasonably smooth, it's fine. Behind the blue car. Do you want to grab And the off oil pump is actually on this side. £390 plus back. We ordered 10. Cool. So I'm here with John Thorne. Thanks for your time, John. Appreciate it. Uh, John knows a thing or two about McLarens. He's had a few through your... It's fair to say, a few through your arms in, in your lifetime, right? Getting through that way, so we've, obviously we've owned personally five cars, I suppose. We have serviced... We now have nearly 800 customers. And right. I now... We, we did a video, haven't we driven? I've now... I think we're up to about 14 million miles where I've driven wow. McLarens covering that many cars. So on average, I drive three a day. So a five day week. So, so add it all up, you work it out over 11 years, it's quite a lot of cars. It is, I'll put a link to John's channel in the description. If you're after some deep dive McLaren info, check it out, it's very interesting. I spent a lot of time on there looking through those videos, geeking out, but we just had a 650S on the ramp, had a look at how they inspect the cars, very exciting stuff. Just to rewind, McLaren's reliability. It comes up all the time. It has to be the, the standard question I get from everywhere and every yeah. interview you do. And the fact of life is, is that life, all things in life, reputation is based part on fact mm. and part on real world fact. Mm. And the issue you have is that McLaren as a company are very good at presenting an image that can be a little bit hostile to people. Yeah. A little bit arrogant, shall we say. And that generates a position where people are looking for them to fail. Um, and it's not uncommon, especially in the, in the British psyche, you know, sometimes success is downplayed rather than played up. Yeah, you don't of course get it in yeah. America. Um, an issue you have is that that kind of mentality and also their, their, uh, their central USP of being a technology sell mm. is a hard place to be. You know, if you're selling your, your product based on being technology the best thing out there and it doesn't work, it's a bigger failure than selling it on yep. passion and, and, you know, say someone's broken down a Ferrari, it's oh, it's Ferrari, it's talent. Yeah, yeah. You broke down a McLaren, oh, it shouldn't break down, it's perfect. So there's some bit of history there. But also the fact of life is that you know, McLaren have had a, a period of time where their assembly of their cars has not been as good as expected. Mm. And their attitude and position of customer care post-sale has been a little bit failing. Mm. Uh, and all those combined together generates a position where people say McLaren equals poor reliability, not very really good. Yeah. Depreciation of values is horrible. So yeah. it's one of those ones where the weight of the information I can see generates a position of negativity. Yeah. But the real life world is I can look at, if I look through all that and, and cut through all the all respective internet rumors and everything else there and simply look at cars through our workshop and cars that we speak to owners worldwide. We now have dealers around the world now. Yeah. And I can tell you hand on heart that we do not see multiple cars coming in with 10, 15,000 pound worth of work on it mm. every single time. So for us, given an average week, let's say we'll do 10 cars, mm. let's say as a week, I can guarantee eight of those cars will be in and out for a nice, simple 600 pound service and the customer's on the way without an issue. Yes, there'll be two cars with more costs and more issues behind it, with a, a variety of reasons why, but eight out of 10 through our workshop on a weekly basis are simple, yeah. easy work. And that to me is the value aspect of being reliability. Yeah, that. and just to touch on a point you made there, do you think that some of that reliability reputation stems from maybe one or two bad cases that were shouting too loudly online on YouTube, perhaps? Well, this is why I intimated that, that McLaren sort of position with people. Yeah. I'm sure they'll hate me for saying it, but they are arrogant. Mm. They really are. Uh, and they're difficult to deal with in that regard. <laughs> Even what we do. And, and that, so that means if you have a, an issue with your product, and your response back from the customer care side is arrogant, 
the immediate response was, well, hang on a bit, I'm now going to tell someone yeah, else yeah. and someone else. If the initial response was, I'm really sorry, how can we resolve that for you? That person wouldn't need to rant and rave and complain mm. about it. And that's one of the reasons that we've got into doing seller return cars for customers is that not because we like selling cars, we don't. Yeah. What we do like is having people having a brand new or a new McLaren, driving it home, going to a dinner party, going to the pub, and the friend will say, what's it like? Brilliant, fantastic car, wonderful. And that's what gets reputation. Yeah. And what you have at the moment, or historically to that point in time, someone who buy a McLaren, they'll take it from the dealership, and a little light will come on. Be tiny, niggly problems. Yeah, yeah, one of the, the senses. the first response yeah. to the car is, I've got my new McLaren, oh, I like him on, oh, what a pain in the neck. Yeah, and yeah. that's what we're trying to avoid. And it's very easy to avoid. Yeah. It's even easier to avoid it becoming a problem if you handle the person right at that point in time. And sadly, historically, that's not yeah. been their strong point. So if you had to kind of sum up the, the nature, common nature of any specific type of problem you see, we'll park corrosion to one side for a moment. Mechanically, would, would there be anything that jumps out? We get this a lot. And, and whilst all the cars have some commonality, they share engines, they gearbox, yeah, to some yeah. extent, the process behind it. Each model has slightly different vagary issues to deal with. You know, for mm. example, uh, sports series have things like cracked hinges, which you don't get in super yeah. series cars. The super series cars can get accumulator failures. Obviously, it doesn't mm. apply to sports series that have accumulators. Um, gearboxes and engine issues are all, all commonality between them. They are rare to death. I mean, yeah. I haven't had a gearbox in probably a couple of months. Um, I'm doing one engine now, what we do probably four or five a year. Bear in mind, we have 800 old customers. That's not a big failure rate. Um, there's no consistency across all the models I'd have, except for one thing, it's the condition of the car. McLaren's biggest issue on a reliability basis is either not looked after properly yeah. or they're looked after by people who don't really know what they're doing. They're not complicated cars to work on. They really aren't. It's a car, four steering wheels and steering wheels. Exactly, yeah. But there are bits about how you look after, what to look for, that really are just knowledge-based. Um, mm. and, and, and dealers should have that. Um, and obviously people like us and other independents with experience have that. But if you go to the average supercar dealer who sells three McLarens a year and 70 Lamborghinis a year, yeah. I guarantee their Lamborghinis better. Um, they won't know as much, therefore they'll do a repair or they'll miss a repair, yeah. which is easy to fix, but if you don't know it's there, you can't fix it. And mm. in the inspection we showed you, you know, with broken springs, for example, yep. it's so easy to miss. Quite mm. clearly there, quite clearly yeah. but easy if you're looking spot, yeah. for them in the right way, you wouldn't see them. Get that rear diffuser off, I think, is the moral of the story there, <laughs> the right? one, yeah. I mean, it, it's also not helped the fact that, again, McLaren, and we are working on for this, they don't support independence at all. No. I mean, they are absolutely resonant. Paint codes being a prime example of that, right? They won't supply paint codes. They won't supply paint. They won't supply mm. a diagnostic kit. Yeah. Still, I mean, all these things are technically unlawful in the UK yeah. and in Europe. They do it anyway. Now, fortunately, over a period of time, we're starting to break that down, and we developed our own diagnostic kit. We have our own paint. Um, but it, it's getting better. Yeah. But by definition, if you're the average supercar retailer, let's so mm. sell cars, and you can't diagnose a, the, the issue, you can't even turn off a service light, um, would you rather part exchange a McLaren in for one with that yeah. kind of legacy issue or get another 911 in that you could reprogram, you can service, change the light? I mean, you, think about it, you can't even reprogram a service light. So your service required light. So you're a supercar dealer, yeah. you've got four McLarens of part exchanges, you've got to take it to a dealer just to turn the light off. Now, you know, he's got XYZ profit in the car, but it's already being eroded down, so he can't do it. Therefore, when the part exchange, so come, someone comes in for a nice 911 they got in stock, would you give a better price for another 911? Yeah. Or a better price for the McLaren 12C, assuming they're downgraded to a 911? Yeah. Um, they're going to do whatever, it's easy. And McLaren don't get that. If they made it available, mm. so they could do that kind of work, mm. there'd be a better support for the aftermarket. But independent for them is a four letter word. And mm. until that attitude changes, it's always going to be that issue. The, the difference is that people like us, look after cars well and that's course, what's yeah. building reputation up. Yeah, as did I. So looking at the power plant of the McLaren, the M838, M840 engine, it's a great lump Nissan racing engine, right? That's what it derives yeah, from. Yeah, Coopsy engine from yeah. back in the day, yeah. So it's been going through how Cosworth now, the supplier, well, the reworkers for them now. Exactly. Really, really nice flat plane crank, buzzy, fun, exciting. Any problems to look out for on those, you see? Are they generally pretty reliable? Because my experience has been good, I think, on the whole. It, it, it's won, it won every engine award out when it came yeah. out. Um, it was designed to be a thousand horsepower engine. Um, it had a budget unlimited in design. Yeah. It is probably one of the best engines ever created. Uh, it, it's one Big downside. Words. <laughs> Big words. It, it's one downside. Is that it does require, well, the one downside is part design. So generally most engines, when, they, when the cams rotate, they yeah. rotate into the oil feed. So basically what happens, the cam rotates and it picks up oil mm. as part of the lubrication process. The downside to that is by virtue of doing that, it generates um, drag on the engine and the oil. Um, all the McLaren engines, be it 3.8 or 4 litres, the cams are counter-rotational, so they fling oil off. 
that's how they rotate. So it means on the first start off of the car, technically it's dry. It's dry, yeah. So that's why you have to build up oil pressure very quickly, make sure you get lubrication mm. from there. So the issue you have on the engine inherently is that because of that counter rotational uh, cam, which is generating significant amounts of power, why it's mm. so efficient in terms of car, you have to be careful on startups, you have to be careful on, on revving the car when it's cold until it's got oil pressure. Right, yeah. So the only inherent issue we find on the engines is where the cam phases wear out, which is all part of the top end. And it, what yeah. happens is either the car is revved hard when cold, or the car is driven with low, no low oil on it. Right. Those are the two issues mm. that generate the, the top end wear. And it can be followers, it can be rockers, it can be the cam phase, it's all top end. So that's a consistent one we do, both of which are avoidable. Mm. Either A, don't rev the car when it's cold, and B, keep an eye on your oil temperature, or your oil level. The downside to it, obviously, a dry sump system, the only way of checking your oil level is on the dash. Now, it's not complicated. It's a couple of tweaks sort of with a stalk and off you go. Mm. But you'd be amazed how few owners either have no idea to do it or haven't been told to do it. So we, as an example, constantly saying to people, check your oil level every couple of weeks. Every yeah. two or three weeks, just check your oil level. It's not difficult to do. Make sure the car is warmed up, not too hot. Make sure it's warmed up. Check your oil level. Make sure it's in the, in the green area. It doesn't need to be very specific. And then cover that, you're fine. I mean, we... we it's car, car basics 101, isn't it? Check the oil level, right? I mean, you've got to be doing that, especially on a, a car that's so expensive, so valuable, and so capable, so finely tuned. It's, it's not difficult, but then we had a 720 come here, just happened to, on his way back yeah. home, come in here, and, and uh, he said he got a lumpy idle on it, and it was misfire. And we just happened to be here, it was late in the day, yeah. and we saw a quick look at it, and we checked the oil, and it was low. We put half a litre in it, low. We put two and a half a litre into it, and it still wouldn't register on the oil level. And we go back through to go and research, like, I'm really sorry, I don't think you should drive this car. Well, I've just put two and a half litres in, I still can't get a level, which means it's at least three or four litres down. Yeah. It only takes seven and a half. This is an issue. And I said, you've never checked your on the car? And he said, well, I bought the car and they told me the engine was sealed, didn't need to. Now, what? I don't know whether that's a bit of hyperbole from the owner, yeah. <laughs> but it's a kind of that arrogant type thing from McLaren who say, oh, no, the car's perfect, sir. Yeah. You don't need to worry about it. Remember when they first launched the 12C back in the day, yeah. if you had a, a, a tyre pressure light came on, the advice was you had to take it to a dealer because only they were qualified to do your tyre pressures. I mean, it's bad, this. Nitrogen filled it, by unicorns. Exactly. Kind of yeah. So, so and, and, you know, from a perspective, you and I would say, didn't check your all. No offence, yeah. you're an idiot. Yeah. Okay? But if you're sold a car and it's sold with a, oh, it's perfect, so it's so technically advanced yeah, you can't yeah. touch it, I get that. I, yeah. I, understand, I can see why, they, why we have yeah. those issues. That guy needed a new engine. Any weak spots in that engine? So forged versus cast pistons, internals, that kind of thing? Again, I mean, the, on the, we see a lot from the race car because our engine builders race mm. engines as well. Um, they're slightly different in terms of what issues you tend to find with yeah. those ones. Specifically on the four litre, the rods will, will break at 820 horsepower. Right. Um, they, it's a lot of horsepower. Really, it is. Fair. It's standard cars, 720 off, yeah, 20, yeah. 720 or so. Um, and I see a lot of people, and uh, you know, mapping them up to 900,000 horsepower. That's perfectly possible. I mean, we ran our one with 850 horsepower for a while, and we came for to a them, while. For a while, yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 didn't, I never released the map. Yeah. I never released the map. Right. So people ring up say, "I want to remap the 720." Yeah, and I yeah. said, "The problem I've got is I know for a fact once I get to 820, I'm on borrowed time." It will go eventually. Yeah. And I've had conversations with people who are in the States, etc., who say, why don't you release a map? Why don't you sell me a map? And, and, and they say, and I say, look, beyond 820, I won't do it. Mm. And they go, oh, I've been running 950 horsepower with my Avgas map from so tuning company in the States. And they go, great, fantastic. And I go, no problem. Yeah, you could have that for, for, for 100 years, or we'd have it for an hour. Yeah. And I had, I had three conversations now. We now rebuild engines for people around the world. It's a nice bit of business for us. And I have a conversation with people, they say, John, you're too conservative, it can take more. I have the same conversation three months later, they bring me up and say, my engine's blown. And I go, you yeah. know what, you know, that's how it's going to be. Forged rods, pistons are fine, everything else is fine. You don't worry yeah. about anything else in terms of heads, everything else there. The pistons are, sorry, the rods are the weakness of the yeah. litre. On the 3.8, um, everything is better. Um, but it can't take the same amount of power in terms of, of course, overall because yeah, yeah. the turbo is limited. Right. Um, and then on the sports series cars, the main thing we find is liners. Okay, yeah. There was a change in supply on a liner, and if you map yeah. a sports series, you get a cracked liner, yeah. and what you have is base in blowback and causing that. That's yeah. quite expensive. Yeah. We've seen some drop valve cars. Nine times out of ten, it's over revving. Um, drop yeah. valves is a rev related issue rather than not. We've only seen, what, four in eight yeah. years, so I wouldn't say it's common. So, inherent issues, yeah, liners on sports series cars, but only when mapped, and rods at higher power at four litres. 
the top end or all of them based on all. Those would be the ones to look for. So I think what we're saying is if your car is well maintained, there is no reason to fear a McLaren whatsoever. Not at all. Uh -huh. I mean, we've owned personally five cars. All of our cars over the years of owning them have been modified fairly heavily. Yeah. Um, they've all done 30, 40,000 miles each. I've got customers on our books now and now 160,000 miles on Impressive. 12 Impressive, yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a, a customer of ours who works in the oil industry and lives in Spain. So he commutes from Spain to Scotland once a month. Yeah, 139,000 miles his car's done. Uh, it's a bit tatty, you know, having that kind of margin of the paint and everything else there. For sure. And it still goes strong. We see him once every 12 months. Um, once every six months normally, because the amount of miles he's yeah, doing. Yeah. And, you know, he's done the usual stuff. Things have worn out. But I've no indicate. We, we do a leak down test and a compression test engine every time. Yeah. Still bang on the numbers. These are long-term cars. It's great to hear. It's, great, yeah. doing, really it's really good to hear. Um, if we look at somebody who wants to buy a McLaren, warranty, what should they be looking at there? Important things to consider, because this is a bit of a, a touchy subject. I sometimes. love the term warranty. The, yeah. the problem you have is that warranty does not mean everything goes wrong in a car, someone else pays a bill. 100%, and, yeah. and, and it is sold by people with that kind of accolade. Yeah. Here is a car, nothing will go wrong with that car, sir. The best warranty out there is the manufacturer's warranty, because mm. legally they have to protect the car entirely yeah. the first three years. Beyond three years, you are buying an insurance contract. It doesn't matter if it's McLaren or it's us or any of the warranty companies, you're buying an insurance contract. And like all insurance contracts, there are exclusions. Yeah. So the way to look at it is like you buy an insurance policy, and the same way we sell ours as an insurance policy. But you say, look, um, it covered all these things, um, but it won't cover these things, which are, in our perspective, we keep it very simple. We say anything's wear and tear. Mm. If that can wear out, by definition, you can't warrant it. Or anything that's basically abuse. So for us, anything that's a rubber hose, for example, rubber degrades over time. Yeah. A rubber seal, that degrades over time. A metal seal, that shouldn't do, that's covered. Um, you know, a spring for corrosion, can't cover a corrosion, but if it's snapped for no other reason mechanical, we can cover it. See, it's not quite as simple as that process. Yeah. So people buy a second-hand car and they buy it at the warranty, and as the inspection showed, all these things wouldn't have been covered because they would either be sort of wear and tear yeah. or they'd be sort of abuse. Now, it's hard to do a second-hand car, that process. Yeah, yeah. So really, we, we make a, a, the statement we say to people. We say, look, first of all, on the cars that we sell, for example, we give a warranty of three months anyway, mm. okay, from the get-go, straight away. Most warranties have a 30-day exclusion. So you drive the car off the forecourt. If you have a problem within two or three days, the warranty won't cover it because mm. of the exclusion period, because the warranty company who's bought, who sold this warranty to the dealer, if it goes wrong straight away, their statement will be, well, hang on a minute. It's gone wrong already. You didn't inspect it properly. You can't blame us yeah. for that. Yeah. Our warranty starts the day you drive the car because far as it is, it's our warranty. Um, but then you can extend it if you wish to. And our, our mantra is the same: is, Do you want to? You've got three months to decide. And in that three months, if you think you're a bit nervous about the car, get the warranty. Peace yeah. of mind. But generally speaking, the cars we sell don't need a warranty. It's down to a, a personal choice, really. But yes, there's a huge difference between three of them, different kinds. Certainly, the manufacturer's warranty must cover all manufacturing defects. Beyond that, things like bodywork aren't covered. Corrosion, as you mentioned, are not covered. Yeah. Um, and you know, it gets complicated when you have things like hinges, which is a big mechanical hinge, and McLaren could see that bodywork. Yeah. Yeah. And it's then, really not. It's, it's a piece of engineering. You don't I need say to be have a degree in engineering to yeah. realise that a big hinge that weighs three yeah, kilos is not bodywork. But that, that's, yeah. that's it. It's, not, it's an insurance term. Yeah. And if you're open-minded about it, then you see the process behind it. Yeah. Very soon the engine will be paintwork as well, right? Correct. But, yeah, but, but anyway, we, we won't go there. So corrosion is obviously a bit of an issue with these. Uh, I think every 570 that I've seen has or will eventually get some form of corrosion. We know it's the application process that, that uh, causes that. I don't think we need to talk about that today because it's probably been done to death. Um, but I guess what, does the, what do you think the future holds for McLaren in terms of improvement of quality for cars like the Artura, for cars like the 750? Do you think they're going to learn from these mistakes and be able to apply that to the new manufacturing going forwards. Um, That's the important thing. I think. I'd like to say everyone learns from mistakes, but now I make more mistakes than anybody and I hope I'm <laughs> learning for each one, frankly. Um, the, the downside with McLaren is that it's, it is, it is uh, as, as an ongoing concern, as a business concern, it's a tough one to justify. It is, yeah. Uh, but it has very rich backers with very deep pockets and they love it and they support it in cash. Mm. As long as they keep doing it, I have no fears for the company and I have no fears for long-term position. The downside you have is that you are at the risk of that particular backer, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the Saturday Night Tackle that yeah. holding, yeah. still liking it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's always a concern. You're yeah. at the whim of someone else's is behest. The, the good news is that mm. they have great engineers. Yeah. Um, and um, they've lost a lot, but they still have great engineers. Um, and the product they generate on an engineering base is still the best out there. Yeah. Um, Everyone says that. The, the downside will be is their assembly process. 
and whether or not they have the budget to assemble it and the quality control to maintain that. Yeah. And that is up and down by what budget they've got money in the bank. Yeah. Um, I always say to people, the best built McLaren from the get-go was a 675LT. Right. And if you look at historically, that car was developed and the car was made when McLaren had loads of cash. Yeah, right. they, they had loads of money there. Um, the worst build launch car for them from the get-go was a 720 Coupe. Because yeah. at that point in time, Problems. they were running out of money yeah. um, and it had to be out there. It had to build cars. They had this stupid plan to build X number of you know, 2020 vision they had yeah. from the previous end. The yeah, Artura's not been with that issue either, right? Well, that's the issue you got. So, so we look at the current situation. McLaren aren't exactly flush with cash, yeah. but they're okay. They've got a car which they've had technical problems with all the way yeah. through. I mean, we've had, what, three launches now that yeah. failed. Yeah. Um, I'm sure the end result will be brilliant. If you look at it now, base spec is 160, 170. Yeah, it's expensive when you add it up. Even with basic toys, and it's north, of, two, north, north yeah. of 200, easy. Yeah. So a decent spec is 220, 230. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's 720 territory. Yeah, it so, is. So you've got the same sort of money to buy a V6 hybrid yeah. or a V8 twin turbo. Yeah. Uh, and the 720 is categorically a higher car now. Better looking as well. And 750 now as well, right? Well, yeah, 750. Which so is the 300k car spec'd up, I think. The question will be is, is do we, will they need a discount? Yeah. I'm told they, they're not going to. Yeah. But then you know, I, 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 I have a hot and cold relationship with our dealers in the UK. <laughs> I mean, I'm the biggest buyer of McLaren parts in, in, the, in the UK, so mm. hence we have some relationship with them because that's where I get them from. But at the same time, I, I do see their issues. You know, I'm, we're quite proud of our workshop here. But it's not a 10 million pound gym palace. <laughs> I don't have a million pounds a year running costs. Yeah. And you've got dealers there that have significantly higher than that. Yeah. They've had no cars to sell for two yeah. years. So the pressure on them just to churn out cars to make a profit, I, I get that. I, I'll, yeah. I'll be the first person to shake the dealer principal hand and say, you've got a tough job. Yeah. So all of a sudden you've got McLaren saying no discounting. You've got a dealer group which has been hemorrhaging money for two years, no cars to sell. In the meantime, the poor customers have taken the brunt of it yeah. in customer care, let's be fair. Um, so the, 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 to have a situation where you're saying no discounting on a car that's got a bit of a difficult history and it's priced to a point in time it's a tough sell against the car that's better than it. Yeah, yeah I, I don't predict it being a massive sales success, but at the same time, I, I would like it to be. Yeah. Um, and then obviously, it's, it's how they market it. I had several conversations today with people and I said, if you buy an Archer in the first year of production, you are a braver man than I am. Yeah. If you are looking to buy a car, a McLaren, and you're not looking to have a financial risk out of it, I can think of every other model but an Archer worth buying. Yeah. It will the end result and mechanically engineering be good at the end? I'm absolutely sure it will. Yeah. Will it come out of the forecourt to your hands at this point in time now? You'd be a luckier man yeah. than I am, I think. Yeah. So I guess with all that conjecture there, we have to sum up by saying that the product is still a fantastic one, right? Everyone Clear. that drives it, it, I mean, they're just, I absolutely love them. The, the, the feeling you get from the steering, the brakes, just the, the connection with the road when you're driving is another level. It really is. They're absolutely fantastic cars. I guess McLaren need to do a little bit with their customer service right going forwards. The Artura, I think it could shape up to be a great car. I've test driven it around Silverstone. Uh, they had three running that day. Uh, no fire engines had to arrive at any point. So, it, you know, they, I, I think they're getting on top of it and I, I do want them to be successful and I think you know people like yourself uh, who are passionate about the product and, and help owners out are going to continue to make that ownership experience better for them so yeah appreciate what we, you do we, we will certainly buy an Artura probably a Spider at some point in time but yeah. I can't see it happening with the next 18 months yeah, until yeah. the problems there and you made a valid point you just said to a day and you said as an accolade there were three running with no problems yeah these, these people make thousands of cars a year yeah and we're claiming three without running problems is suddenly a positive thing yeah if we were Porsche right now they would say we have 3,000 <laughs> running without problems. Even yeah. one problem is yeah, an issue. Yeah. So there's a level. I mean, For you, sure, yeah. I mean, yeah. take the positives where you can, and I yeah. agree entirely the Archer eventually will be good. But as a percentage anymore. of cars that are in the UK, though, right now, Archer is probably, <laughs> probably 150%. 100%. Yeah, exactly. every car I've yeah, made in the UK yeah. running. I mean, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd still like to say, I'm not even, I mean, I've, I've driven one very briefly, but with someone else with me, so I couldn't do it with it. I would love to get one on the dyno. Yeah. I'd love to get one on the ramp and go underneath it. I don't think that's happening unless an owner gets one. And as far as I'm aware, there are no end owners in the UK yeah. in their possession. Yeah. Um, there are several demonstrators available for sale at the moment, but I don't see it. Yeah, I'd love to see one. I'd love to get my, get my teeth yeah. into one, but I think I'm going to have to wait for that. So, tough times ahead for McLaren, but hopefully they pull it out of the bag, right? I think they're getting less tough because they now have products that they can start to launch. So, I think... The, You're seeing that reflected in values as well, right, in the used market? Well, in in some, some instances. Some are on the increase, but I think the general... A lot of people are offloading at the moment as well. It's interesting. We've only been selling cars SOR since September last year. Yeah. We sold 34 McLarens already. More Congrats. than anybody else in the country, which That's is right. quite a shock. 
all the prices are going up. Yeah. All of them are going up. And the, and the, the issue you have is that they, they came down too far. Yeah, I mean, they, 12 seats got to 65,000 pounds. They were free pounds. at one point. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> Good enough, yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're now 80, 90, 100,000, where yeah. they should be, and going north where they are now. The risk you have is, yes, of the sales that we have had them fallen through are from people who have been expecting to pay a thousand pound a month finance on this yeah, balloon that's, payment. That's right. And it's double that now. Yeah. You know, when, it, when things were three and a half, four percent, yes, yeah. you can get 700 pound a month. Now they're nine percent, yeah. it's 1500 pound a month. It's not rocket science. Yeah. And that has, you know, all of a sudden your assets sat and your driver used once a weekend that's costing you 700 pound a month is bearable. Yeah. It's costing you two grand a month. Yeah. All of a sudden that's a mortgage payment. Yeah. So yeah, so I think that that is always a negative side of it. Yeah. But in all honesty, obviously we have a shorter period of history in selling cars, mm. but certainly we don't see any, any downward pressure on pricing. Uh, it's going the other way entirely for that, which is good for the brand and good for owners. Yeah, let's hope it continues. Excellent. All right, John, think we can wrap it up. Appreciate Great. your time, your insight. Well, thanks much, appreciate it. Fantastic, thank Cheers you, then. nice one, mate. That is it for this one. Huge thanks to John. Very kind of him to offer up his time there and very interesting insight. I'm definitely going to be watching that one back. A lot of useful information in there. I think the moral of the story is if you're getting any McLaren privately or through a third party dealer, make sure you get it inspected first by somebody that knows what they're doing because it could hide a few issues if it's not thoroughly checked over. So very important to, to do your due diligence there. If you're buying it through a McLaren main dealer, you've got a bit more protection there. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'm off to drive home in a Porsche. Bye.